Well, oh, good morning, uh, everyone, and welcome to our Camp Creek Community Church morning worship service. And uh, thankful for all our church and our family and friends that are able to join us now, and also those that'll be able to watch this uh, later. So, so glad you're here on this uh, thanks beginning of this Thanksgiving week and. Um, Truly, we have much to be thankful for, and um, it's. Uh, I was speaking with uh, Miss Miss Violet, our our church uh, matriarch, uh, uh, who's in her nineties, and would, and there's much has, has been said about how about the dark winter uh, that it's it's going to be a dark winter, and uh, and and Miss Violet, she told me she said there's. There's no, ain't gonna be no dark winter. <laughs> she says it's every day. You just get up and you just praise the Lord and and rejoice for, of all the blessings He's given you. And and uh, and every and all all winter days are gonna be bright. Every day will be bright. That's a lot of wisdom. Uh, so uh, let's just rejoice in the Lord today. I know there's a lot. There's a lot of. There's a lot of problems. There's a there's a lot going on in the world. There's there's much distress and and anger and bitterness and and there's sickness and there's suffering all over. We understand all that, but we can rejoice in the Lord. I know many of you are are, are grieving uh, those that have lost loved ones. Um, and I know Rebecca, y'all just buried your sister. Um, anyways, and and there's so many others. Uh, I, I can't I can't even begin to mention them all when I don't I, I can't spend this time doing that so uh, these burdens that are on your heart and that are on my heart uh, let's just lift them up to the Lord together uh, and, and let's go to him in prayer Heavenly Father we we are thankful we are thankful for uh, for the innumerable blessings that that you have that you have bestowed upon us. And I'm thankful, Lord, that I was able to get out of bed this morning and um, and, and I'm able to, to read and study your word and and even, God, that you've given me the ability to, to share what what you have uh, what you have what you have said and shown to me. So God, we're thankful. And uh, I know that there are many burdens and there are many needs. I know there's much sickness. Uh, the COVID is is very heavy, especially in uh, around where we're at here in West Virginia. And, um, and there's much fear, and our country is in the midst of turmoil and conflict, and the and all the world is. We know that it's a that it's fallen man that's in a fallen creation, and yet you reign supreme over all these things. So God, we give you thanks. And we lift up our burdens and our requests and our needs to you. And we know, <clears throat> Father, that you that you know about each one of us intimately. That you hear and you answer, God, that you're with us. You know the burdens. You know the, the need on every heart. More than anything else, God, above all the above all the needs that we have, whether or not we even know it or not, Lord, the greatest need of the human soul is a spiritual need. And so, God, those of us that have experienced the miracle of the new birth, we thank you for it. And we pray, God, that you would, you would give that gift of life to one even here this morning that does not know you. That as we're about to study in our text in John 9, how you how the Savior opened the eyes of the blind man, that you would open the eyes of one that is spiritually blind this day, that they would see the glorious truth of the gospel that is and the salvation that is found in Jesus Christ our Lord and be saved this day. Be with those that are hurting, Father. Give comfort, give healing according to your will, and open our eyes and ears that we would understand your word. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, so, and good morning. Uh, <coughs> as I said, and I'm glad the, uh, those of you that are, are logging in now, and uh, as we just said in our morning prayer, uh, 
we're so thankful for all that the Lord's given us. And we know this is Thanksgiving week. And if I forget to say it at the end, happy Thanksgiving to, to each and every one of you. And uh, but we're coming this morning uh, with thankful hearts to, to worship our Lord and to learn a portion of his word. Our text this morning, as we have been in the Gospel of John, chapter 9, uh, we want to continue uh, this is the second message, and uh, uh, Lord willing, there will there will be a two more messages from uh, from from this chapter and, and this encounter of Jesus uh, with this blind man, and and so this morning we want to to look at the um, at the conversation or the confrontation between the blind man and the Pharisees. Uh, last week we looked at the healing of the blind man. Uh, between and, and and that interaction between Jesus and that blind man uh, last week. So our text this morning is taken from John chapter 9, verses 13 through 23, and let's just read these together. Uh, verse 13 of John chapter 9. <clears throat> they brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind, and it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes, then Again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said uh, unto them, He put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed, and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. They say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him, that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents, uh, until they called the parents of him that had received his sight, and they asked them, saying, Is this your son? whom ye say was born blind, how then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did, did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, he is of age. Ask him. And God added his blessing to the reading of his word. So uh, as we look, uh, last Sunday, we see this blind beggar who is outside of the temple. Uh, he's He's helpless, he's hopeless, and he's begging. And, and he's not looking for a transformation. He's not, he's not seeking a miracle. All he's looking for is a, a, a morsel of food or a little money, something just for the day, just a, a little something that will get him through the day. And then the day repeats itself over and over and over again for all of his life because he was born blind and he was a beggar. And all he could do was beg. But he wasn't, he wasn't seeking a, a life-changing experience. He was just looking for just a little something to get him through that day, to survive that day. So, so... Uh, um, it's, it's such an illustration of lost man in his sinful condition, in, a, in his spiritual blindness. And, and the whole world seeks, they're, they're looking for something to get them through the day. They, they don't have anything permanent. There's no permanent hope. There's no love. There's no peace. There's no joy. There's some temporary uh, pleasures and the world goes about and they're seeking those little nuggets of pleasure. 
something just to get them through the day, something to try to bring some uh, source of purpose or, or, or meaning to their life, and yet they're unfulfilled because they're blind. And this man, here he was. He was, he was born blind. He, he's a representative of our, of our own spiritual blindness. Before we met Jesus, and, the, and remember, the disciples asked him, said they had no compassion. They're like, eh, here's a, this blind man right here. Who, who's seeing it? Him or his parents that he, was, that he was born this way? And remember, we, I spent way too much time talking about uh, suffering and, and the effects of sin and the purposes of God. And you, and you remember, Jesus said this has nothing to do that his blindness has nothing to do with sin. It does. He, what Jesus was not saying that the parents were sinless or that the man was sinless, because that's not true. There, there are sinners in a world of sin, a, a fallen world that, that is under the sin curse because of the fall of Adam. Yet Jesus was saying this is not a, a specific cause of his blindness. It was because of, of something that he did or something his parents did. He said, but that the, that the works of God would be made manifest in him. And then Jesus, he, he made, the, he spit on the ground and he made the clay and he put it on the guy's, on the man's eyes and he sent him to the pool of Siloam, which means sent. And the man obeyed the Lord and he went and he washed and he received his sight. And that brings us to our text today. Uh, the miracle uh, of one that had been born blind, unheard of. Uh, this, this has never happened before. And nowhere else in Scripture is it recorded where one that was, was born blind received a sight. Others received their sight, but this man was born in this condition. And so, <clears throat> in our, we'll pick up in our text, uh, they uh, brought to the Pharisees him that was a four time was blind. The man that had been born blind, they, and, and, and they is, if you remember from, uh, if you look at verse 8, it's the neighbors therefore, and they which had seen him before, he, before the, when he was blind, and, and, uh, and they asked, is not is he that begged? Remember, they, they were like, no, it looks like, the, it looks like the guy that was blind that was begging. Oh, I couldn't be him. I was like, yeah, it's him. And remember the blind man said, yeah, it's me. It's me. I was born blind. Now I can see. Uh, and so these are the ones, these neighbors and acquaintances that knew the blind man before when he was blind and now see that he sees, they bring him to the Pharisees. Now, why did they bring him to the Pharisees? And, and I think we're going to see in our text here, and as we read in our text, I believe it was out of fear because uh, Jesus had healed this man on the Sabbath day and they already knew that Jesus sought to kill Jesus and there was always already the threat to anyone that acknowledged Jesus. They wouldn't even speak his name for fear of the Pharisees. And so they know of this thing that's happened and, and they take him to the Pharisees to... <laughs> so that they won't be held guilty or accountable for, for what has taken place or what is being said. They bring the man to the Pharisees, I believe because it was the Sabbath day and because of, of the fear that they had for the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees, now these people, they are, they are in wonder and amazement at what has happened, and they're rejoicing with the man who was blind and now can see. The Pharisees have no such notions about them. They're, 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 they're uh, interrogating this man, not for the reasons to try to understand what has taken place or understand truth. Their whole purpose is to uh, accuse the one who is the truth uh, and to de deny truth that is staring them right in the face. And so it was the Sabbath day, verse 14, as I said, when Jesus made the clay. And this is why they brought them to the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees, in their minute rules that go above and beyond the Mosaic law, their list of rules, they would say that him 
uh, stooping down and making the clay would be considered uh, an, an act of work, which is a violation of the Sabbath day. And obviously, by him uh, opening the eyes of the blind man, as we see in verse 14, uh, obviously performing a miracle, if making clay uh, breaks the Sabbath, almost certainly then performing a miracle would break the Sabbath, a, a, according to these hypocritical Pharisees. Um, and, and, and so, you know, they... <clears throat> They're questioning, they're questioning the Lord of the Sabbath. And, and this, we, we see this first take place in John chapter 5 and verse 9, 9 through 18. When, when, when Jesus, by the pool of Bethesda, he heals the man uh, that, was, that was crippled, that couldn't walk. And when he healed him, he told him to take up your bed and walk. And remember the Pharisees like, hey, you can't be, you can't be carrying your bed. It's the Sabbath day. Well, what was he supposed to do with his bed? He was, he was laying in, in, a, in, a, in a condition where he could not walk, he could not move, and it was what he was laying on, begging, in a crippled state, and a man named Jesus came by and, and said, take up your bed and walk, and he got up. He didn't need the bed anymore. He couldn't leave it laying in the street, and the Savior, the Master says, take it up and walk. Get that bed out of here. You don't need it anymore. And the Pharisee says, what are you doing walking around with your, with your bed? You're breaking the Sabbath day. Oh, the blindness of these religious leaders. And, and then they, they sought to slay him. And you can read all this for yourself again in John chapter 5. Because he claimed to, that he was the son of God. That he must do the works of the Father. And then they sought to kill him because... Not only had he performed this miracle on the Sabbath day, but now he made himself equal with God. And so they, and, and so they, were, they sought to kill him. And this is, now goes, it continues all the way until he is actually crucified. Because again, the Pharisees now, we're, we're back in our text in verse 15. They, they asked him, again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. Now, if you remember in verse 10, the, the, those that saw him get healed, they asked him, uh, how are your eyes open? And he said, a man called Jesus, made clay, anointed my eyes, and said to me, go into the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received my sight. Now, the, the, the blind man, he didn't, he didn't know what Jesus looked like. All he heard was his voice. And he, he knew that, that who spoke to him was a man named Jesus. But he didn't know what he looked like, and he didn't know where he was. He, in his blind state, he heard the voice, and he obeyed, and he could see. But then he didn't know who Jesus was. He didn't know where Jesus was. But now, again, the Pharisees, obviously, this story has been recited to them. The Pharisees know exactly what story the man is saying happened to him and who did it to him. And so they ask him again. What, what he's already told to everyone that's asked him, the Pharisees ask him again uh, how he had received his sight. And as I said before, it's the wrong question. It's not how did he receive his sight. It's who gave him his sight. That's the question. The answer is Jesus. <clears throat> and so therefore, uh, and, and then he told them, he told him again, he said, Jesus, he put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed, and I do see. Therefore, verse 16, uh, said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Can you imagine? This man that was born blind, and this is what they have to say about it, this great miracle. Well, he can't be of God, this man. This man named Jesus cannot be of God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath day. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And then, so there was a division among them. And, 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 
And everywhere Christ went, he caused division, and he still, he still does to this day. In Matthew 10, 34, he says, Think not that I came to bring peace on the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. Why? Because Jesus Christ is divisive. Because you, you either, you, you cannot stay in the middle when it comes to Jesus. You either believe Jesus is who he says he is, or you do not, and those that do not, are opposed and hate the one who says that he is God. And because we are in Christ, then they're going to hate us because they hate him. The world hates Christ. And those of us that are in Christ, the world will hate us because we are in Christ. So, but there's this division because here's this man that they're claiming is a sinner that's not following their man-made rules, and yet he's doing things that cannot be explained. Remember when Nicodemus came to him by night in John 3, he says, uh, I, we know, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do the things that you do except God be with him. So Nicodemus, he, and he was, to Nicodemus' credit, he was seeking to understand it, it, more about this man that, that, brought, con, that brought confusion to the natural mind because what Jesus did and what the Pharisees were teaching, they didn't mesh up. And, 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 and what about this Sabbath day? What about him healing on the Sabbath day? In, in John chapter seven, Jesus confronting these Pharisees, he's referring back to when they first sought to kill him in John chapter five, when he healed the crippled man on the Sabbath day. And, and he asked him in John 7, 23, he says, if a man on the Sabbath day receive circumcision, which was, which was a command uh, in, in Leviticus uh, chapter 12, that it would be on the eighth day, according to the law of Moses, that a, that a male child would be circumcised. And you, they, they would circumcise a child on the eighth day, even if it was on the Sabbath day, to keep the law that says to circumcise the child on the eighth day. And Jesus says, well, if you're going to circumcise a child on the eighth day to keep, to keep the law, and, 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 as, and what you're saying to me is, you're basically breaking the Sabbath day to keep the law of Moses as well. He says, well, if you can, if you can, if you can circumcise a child on the eighth day, he's like, well, how are you angry at me because I heal a man on the Sabbath day? How? How does that make sense? It doesn't make sense. And again, later on in John 7, there was a division among the people because of what he said and what he did and how it went against what the Pharisees said and did. Uh, one passage, you can, there's, um, there's several places, but in Luke chapter 14, in verses 1 through 6, this is another occasion where Jesus, he healed often on the Sabbath day. And it came to pass, Luke 14, verse 1, that Jesus went into the house of one of the chief priests to eat bread on the Sabbath day. That, and they watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy, which probably um, some type of congestive heart failure or some skin condition. He, he retained water. It, it was crippling to him. And, and so Jesus answered, uh, so here's this man in a miserable state, in a crippled state. It's the Sabbath day. He's in the house of the Pharisees and, and, and they're watching him because they know what Jesus is all about. And they're going to see if he's, is he going to heal this guy being the Sabbath day? And so Jesus answered Luke 14 verse three and spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace, cowards. And he took him and healed him and let him go and answered them saying, which of you shall have an ass or an ox fall into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him again these things. Now, you see the Sabbath, even in the law of Moses, there was exceptions to the keeping of the Sabbath day. Uh, and you can read those for yourself in Exodus chapter 23 and De Deuteronomy chapter 22. And this is one of those cases Jesus is telling them. So what Jesus is saying is, 
Yes, we, we are to uh, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy is one of the, the commandments. But, you're, but, 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 the, but to serve God, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, it's, it is right and godly to do good on the Sabbath day. And this is what Jesus is telling them. And, and he even says in Matthew 12, 8, he says uh, that, that the Son of Man is Lord even also of the Sabbath. And I can't get into, I, I, I chased the rabbit with suffering last week. I'm not going to this week over the Sabbath. But Jesus is our Sabbath rest. You want, you want to observe the Sabbath day, then worship Jesus Christ because he is the Sabbath. Uh, Hebrews uh, 4, verse 8 and 9. He is our Sabbath rest. Worship Jesus. It's not about the, it's not about the day. Well, we're on the first day of the week when the Lord was risen. And, and there's people that, that run circles around this thing trying to figure out how to keep the Sabbath day. You want to keep the Sabbath day? Keep Jesus Christ in your heart. Honor him every day. Not just the Lord's day. Not just on the, the seventh day, the, sat, the Old Testament Sabbath day. But keep the Lord in your heart every day. He is our Sabbath rest. Our rest is in Him. We worship Him. Verse 17. They say unto the blind man again. The Pharisees. See, this is an interrogation. And, and you, you see this in, in court, in, uh, uh, in, 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 law, in uh, ju- courtrooms. When the lawyers... They're going to ask questions over and over again, or they're going to ask leading questions. They're trying to trip you up. They're, they're trying to get a, uh, a, a, I guess you call it a hostile witness, or one for the, uh, whether they're prosecution or defense, and they're trying to get them to say something that then they can turn around and use against them. This is all the Pharisees are trying to do. They could care less about this man or his prior condition or what happened to him. They are only seeking to destroy Jesus Christ and and they're trying to squash the works of Christ. And so they say unto the blind man again, verse 17, what sayest thou of him? Okay, you that were supposedly born blind and now have received your sight. Well, what do you say about the one that opened your eyes? Ain't this amazing? These are the scholars of the day. These are the ones who were to lead the nation in the scriptures and teach them the truth. They were to give them the charge of the scriptures. And, and scriptures being fulfilled before their very eyes. And they ask a man that was born blind that had never read anything in the scripture. He couldn't read. And they're asking him, well, what do you think? What do you think about him? Who do you say that he was? And, 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 the, and the insight of this man, because he says, now remember when they, the neighbors asked him who did this, he said, a man named Jesus did this. And now he says, who, when the Pharisee says, who do you think he is? He said, He's a, he is a prophet. And, and so what, what he was saying is, is that he, he was a prophet. No man can do these things unless he were sent by God, unless God is with him. Jesus Christ, so this blind man, it, he, doesn't under, he doesn't know Jesus. He doesn't understand what's happened to him. But he's like, what has happened to me? The only thing that can explain this is God. And so if this man named, named, named Jesus gave me my sight, then he must be a prophet of God. And he had courage in that. So, so first he says, this is a man named Jesus that healed me. Now he tells the Pharisees, this is a prophet of God that has healed me. He has not come to that full salvation yet, but he's going to in, in, in two Sundays from now. We'll see this. But for right now, he says he is a prophet. And remember the Samaritan woman before she was converted and Jesus confronted her with all of her sin and all of her past. And she said, I perceive thou, thou art a prophet. And, and in John 6 and John 7, they, 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 they looked to Jesus and the miracles that he did and the words that he spake. And they said, is not this uh, the prophet there in Deuteronomy 18, 15 that was foretold that would, uh, that would come after Moses, the prophet uh, that, that, uh, 
that was to come. The Messiah is who, is who the prophet is. And, and so they read, for is not this the prophet? Uh, but the Jews now, verse 18, they did not believe. Uh, and this is undeniable proof, undeniable evidence. The man is standing right before them. The multitude of witnesses say, this is the blind man. This man was born blind and has been blind his whole life. We don't know how old he was, but the scripture calls him a man. So we can, he, he was of age. He, he, he was a grown man. So he has been in this condition for decades in his entire life. And he stands before them and he can see and he gives testimony to the fact that he can see and that Jesus Christ, the man of, of God, the prophet of God, has given me back my sight, has not given me back my sight, but has created sight within me when I could not see before. Undeniable evidence stares him right in the face. And the, but the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, they asked the parents. So they bring the parents into this, saying, is this your son who ye say was born blind? How? How then doth he now see? How many times does the answer have to come back how he was made to see? And again, the question is not how was he made to see, but who made him to see? And, and, and so they're asking, to, for the third time now this question is asked, how did he receive his sight? So what they're basically saying is, we don't like what we've heard from all the neighbors and all the witnesses. We don't like what we've heard from your son. So we're going to keep asking the same question over and over again until we either get the answer we want or that we can, we can have a perceived uh, 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 purpose to attack the messenger or to, to attack Jesus or attack whoever lays claim to the miracles of Jesus. We're going to keep down this same road. And it reminds me of Jesus in, in Luke chapter 13 and 34 when, he, when he's, he looks over Jerusalem, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killeth the prophets and stoneth them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings and ye would not. He called them stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart, whited sepulchers that appeared beautiful on the outside, but inside were dead, full of dead man's bones. These Pharisees, on all their pomp and their, re and their religious uh, uh, flattery and, that they, and that, that they gave to one another, men exalting men, and inside full of death. They would not come, hardened in heart and mind, will not come to the truth. John 3, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. They don't want to change. They don't want to be different. They're spiritually blind and they're dead in their trespasses and sins. And they don't want to hear about it. And see, that's the miracle of the new birth. Because we, like this blind man, in our spiritual lostness, we were spiritually dead. We weren't seeking. You go to the graveyard and you see how many people you find that are looking for a doctor that are buried in the graveyard. None of them. Nobody's seeking the Lord. He sought me out just as he sought out this blind man. He restored my sight. He gave me sight where I was blind. And he'll do the same for you if you, if you don't know him today. Don't harden your heart as, as, the, as the children in the wilderness did in the days of provocation and they, and, and they provoked the Lord and, and, they, and, and they rebelled against the Lord and they died in the wilderness. Don't die in your sins. Jesus has already told these Pharisees, you will die in your sins. Don't die in your sins. Repent and believe and be saved. And so they asked the parents, what do you say? What do you say about him? And they, his parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, 
but by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. Now listen, the first part of that was all true. Yes, they lay testament. This is definitely, in fact, our son. And he was definitely, in fact, born blind. And then they lie. Because they knew. They knew what had been said. And they knew who did it. They knew how his, their blind son, they knew what Jesus had done. They knew that Jesus had did it. And they knew that he had, uh, how he had made the clay and what he had told their son to do. They knew this. They all knew this. This is, this is all around town. This is the talk of the town. Everybody knows. But they say, oh, oh, we don't know. We don't know. We know he's our son. He was born blind. But what happened to him and who did it to him? Uh, I don't, we don't know. We don't know. But you, you see, uh, he's of age. Ask him. He shall speak for himself. So they say, Yes, this is our son. Yes, he's born blind. Yes, he now can see. But if you want to know who healed him, ask him. And why wouldn't they say the name of Jesus? Out of fear. The same reason why the, the neighbors brought the man to the Pharisees. They're, they're all living in fear because of the threats and the power of the Pharisees. And so it says in verse 22, and you're like, well, how do you know that the parents were lying? How do you know that they were trying to save their own skin? Just read the scripture. Look at verse 22. These words spake, and, and I must add this, ungrateful and unthankful parents. How could they not give praise and honor to the man who had restored the sight of their son that was born blind. How could they not? But they sure didn't. These words spake his parents. Why? Because they feared the Jews. They said, we don't know what happened to him. We don't know who did it to him. Because they feared the Jews, because the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be, he should be put out of the synagogue. Now, I don't think we can, we can hardly uh, grasp what that meant to, to, the, um, to, the, to the early church Jews uh, or to the Old Testament Jews, to, to be put out of the synagogue. That is to be shunned by all of their society, to be separated from their Jehovah God uh, that they had worshipped from uh, from the time the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and as they had been taught in the scriptures and they learned in the synagogue and they went to the temple, they would be shunned. They would be excommunicated. We have no idea. Some of us, I, I know a little bit about what it's like to have a church turn their back completely and, and, and totally upon me. I, I've had an experience like that. And, 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 and I was devastated, but it, but it fades. It's nothing in comparison to what the Jews are threatening to those who breathe the name of Jesus or give praise to Jesus. They would put them out of the synagogue. This was not an idle threat. They meant it. And so they, because of their fear, they said, uh, he's of age, ask him. Now, Proverbs tells us, uh, Proverbs 29, 25, that the, the fear of man bringeth a snare. Man, if you fear. You know, Jesus has said, fear not what man can do to you. <laughs> fear what God can do to you. How he can destroy both uh, body and soul in hell. Don't fear man. Fear God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But uh, the fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Shall be safe. Don't worry about what man can do to you. Jesus, when he healed that, that crippled man in John chapter 5, in verse 40, 44, he says, How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? How can you seek to honor man 
instead of honoring God. Honor God. And the way that the parents were to honor God was to proclaim the name of Jesus. Even though, they, even though they didn't understand all that had taken place, they knew who healed their son. And it was Jesus. And they refused to say his name because of fear. And, and see, they, they would not, the Jews would not. John 7, 13, the, uh, the Jews, no man spake openly of Jesus because of fear of the Jews. They were afraid of the Jews. They were afraid to be put out of the synagogue. They were, they were uh, 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 afraid to be excommunicated from their community. They, was a, uh, you know, they were afraid that their friends would call them different or say they were funny or that they were weird. You know, what are you afraid of? What, are you afraid of man? Are, are you fearful of what man can do to you? Christian, we're not supposed to live in fear. And we had the Prince of Peace that abides in our hearts. In, in Mark 8, verse 38, Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, uh, of him shall the, shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and the holy angels. Jesus said, If you're ashamed of me in this life, I will be ashamed of you. You can't, you can't ride the middle road. Now, this man is progressing towards faith in Jesus Christ. He knows that a man named Jesus healed him. He said he's a prophet, that he must have come from God, and he's going to declare him Lord before the end of this chapter. And he was not ashamed of, of who did it to him. He spoke his name. Now, how about you today? Have you named the name of Jesus? Do you name the name of Jesus? Do you, do you, is, does Christ have the preeminence in your life? We should be as the psalmist wrote in Psalm 121 and verse 1. I will lift up mine eyes upon the hills from, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. God's not asleep. He's on his throne. He reigns supreme on this earth. He reigns supreme in our hearts. Give him the glory for it. Child of God, give him the glory. And we live a name. As I said, you want to keep the Sabbath, keep Christ in your hearts and the works of Christ in your heart, the works of the Holy Spirit that indwells you. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12 through 15, he's, Paul speaking to the church, speaking to Christians, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy. I love it, King James, bowels of mercy. It's the mercy that comes from, from having mercy bestowed upon you. It comes from the depths of your soul. We can have mercy on others because God has had mercy on us and saved us. That we are to be holy and beloved. The bowels of mercy and kindness and humbleness of mind, meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. And if any man hath a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity or, the, or love, the love of God, which is the bond of perfectness. Perfect love casteth out fear and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you are called in one, one body and be ye thankful. You want a Thanksgiving verse to, to, to live by and, 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 let, and let this verse be, be the filter of your conversation and your, and your correspondence on Facebook and social media, there's a good one for you right there. Let the filter of the Holy Spirit guide your actions and your thoughts and your, and your words and your deeds. Let the Holy Spirit guide you. And above all these things, you're right, Miss Violet. Be thankful. It's not a dark day. It's not a dark winter. We have the Holy Spirit of God that indwells us. Be thankful. Hallelujah. Happy Thanksgiving, right? Well, let me share this and, I, and I'll be done. There, uh, and, and, and I, I, I want to share a little bit about, about this person who's, who wrote this song that, that I'm going to, the hymn I'm going to uh, read for us here in just a minute. Look at here, Fanny Crosby, <laughs> 1820 to 1915. She was blind. She was blinded at six weeks old by a quack doctor that didn't know what he was doing. She lost her sight. 
because he malpracticed medicine. And so she's, she's been blind since six weeks of old, really has no memory of her sight. And she's been blind her entire life. And, 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 and soon after she was struck with blindness, her, her father died. And, and then she eventually did get married as, as she was grown and got married and she had a child and the child died in infancy. Now this is a person that's got a, that it would have a lot that, that we might would say would have an ax to grind, wouldn't we? But she began writing poems and hymns uh, and, and the earliest recording is from the age of eight years old. And, and I want to read this first poem that, that's, that's recorded that she wrote. Age eight years old, blind. Oh, what a happy soul I am, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world, contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. <laughs> From an eight-year-old blind girl that, that we would say, it's not fair what's happened to her. And that's the context. This is the person in it. And look, she wrote over 9,000 of, of hymns, many of which we still sing to, to this day. And from eight years old until just shy of her 95th birthday, she wrote these hymns and gave God glory. And this is one of those hymns by Fanny Crosby. Take the world, but give me Jesus. Take the world, but give me Jesus. All its joys are but a name, but his love abideth ever through eternal years the same. Take the world, but give me Jesus, the sweetest comfort of my soul. With my Savior watching o'er me, I could sing though billows roll. Take the world, but give me Jesus. Let me view his constant smile. You get that? She's blind, but let me view. She's seeing with spiritual eyes. Let me view his constant smile. Then throughout my pilgrim journey, light will cheer me all the while. She had no light in her physical eyes, but she had the light of the world in her heart. Take the world, but give me Jesus. In, my, in his cross, my trust shall be. And then I love this last uh, phrase of this last verse. Till with clearer and brighter vision, face to face, my Lord, I see. And she saw, which she was absent from the body, and she was present with the Lord, and she saw Jesus, and she's with Jesus, and she sees Jesus. No, it's not about this life. Oh, she had it right. It's not, it's not about physical blindness. This, this miracle has... It's so little to do with this man receiving his physical sight. It's what Jesus, how Jesus leaves him at the end of this chapter that's so important with spiritual sight. And then the, and then the uh, course, all oh, the height and depth of mercy, all oh, the length and breadth of love, all oh, the fullness of redemption, pledge of endless life above. Take the world, give me Jesus. And I trust that's your, that's your prayer and hope today as well. You can take the world. Give me Jesus. God bless you. Happy Thanksgiving. I love you in the Lord.